Isaiah 6 is where we're going to be this morning. Isaiah 6. Let me read this section to you, Isaiah 6, starting in verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings. With two they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doorway shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I'm a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand with the glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with thongs, he touched my mouth and with it, and he said, Now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who should I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here I, am, here I am, send me. And he replied, go, say to these people, keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive. Make the minds of these people dull, deafen their ears and blind their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their minds and turn back and be healed. And then I said, until when, God? And he replied, until cities lie in ruins without inhabitations, houses are without people, the land is ruined and desolate, and the Lord drives the people far away, leaving great emptiness in the land. And though a tent shall remain in the land, it will be burned again, like the terebinth or the oak that leaves a stump when it's felled, the holy seed is in the stump. So this morning we're continuing our series called God Is, and in this series we're looking at four foundational truths about who God is, and that when we really believe them, will be crazy enough to live differently and that our lives will look different. But if you were here last week, I said the reality is by human nature that we don't believe these truths. And that caused us to live lives of no impact and no change and no significance, always wondering where and how change is going to happen in us and through us. And what we're going to, where we're going with this is to see lasting change in our lives is that we would be Radical enough to believe that God could use us to change the world. We want to live our lives in such a way that bring utmost glory to God. And as a result, the world around us and the community around us sees Jesus. We want to see lasting change. Change that's real. Change that's deep-seated. But the thing that keeps us from living lives radically for Jesus is the fact that there's sin in our lives. Last week we talked about whenever we sin, that there's always four different layers to the sin, whatever sin we commit. The first layer is what we see on the surface. These are the actions, the attitudes, the behaviors. These are the visible things. These are the things that you know are wrong. So we can see in our lives things that are not like Jesus, things that God tells us not to do, behaviors that are contrary to Scripture. We see things like worry, we see anxiety, we see lust, we see pride. We see these things on the surface. Oftentimes, you see them and others see them. But underneath that is this something that drives those attitudes, those actions, those behaviors in our lives. This is the area of our lives that has failed to produce what it's promised. We put our hope in a job, and then we get laid off, and it produces worry. We put our hope in our savings or in a retirement account, and then the stock market doesn't do well, or that disappears and anxiety is produced. It's an area of our life that has failed to produce what we thought it promised. But underneath that is what fuels it. We talk about how there are these idols in our lives. The four main idols that we fight, that most of us fight, are the things that we'll be addressing over the course of these four weeks. These include the things like the need to be in control, to need the need to have the approval of others, to need the need to have comfort and security, 
the need for power. The desire for one of those four things is what fuels us to sin. It makes us look for something other than God and produces in us sinful behaviors, actions, and attitudes. But underneath all of that is a source. The source is really simple. The source is that we doubt God's character. We doubt that God is in control of our lives, and so we try to be in control. We doubt that God has approved of us, so we look for approval everywhere else around us. We doubt that God alone satisfies, so we look elsewhere for comfort and satisfaction. We doubt that God is powerful, so we look elsewhere for power and control. We doubt those things, and we seek it on our own, and we believe this illusion of our own supremacy. See, if we're going to learn to not look at just what we see, but what is underneath, we have to learn to see our sin and struggle through this lens. What we see is just on the top, but we have to go much deeper to get to the root of our sins. If we deal with just the action, if I just tell you, hey, stop lusting, or stop getting angry all the time, that's just dealing with the action. That's just basically putting a Band-Aid on it, but underneath it, there's stuff still going on that will manifest itself in other ways. And so during this series, we want to deal with what's underneath. The solution to these issues is understanding and believing and living out these four truths in our lives. The first truth we looked at last week is that God is great. So you and I, we don't have to be in control of our lives. This morning, we're going to see that God is glorious, so we don't have to fear other people. Next week, we'll see that God is good, so we don't have to look elsewhere. And then finally, that God is gracious, so we don't have to prove ourselves. See, it's my belief that these four things engage control, approval, comfort, and power in such a way that they remind us that God is the only one that can meet these needs in our lives. See, when I hear these things, my response is, they're not the deepest things I've ever heard. I look at these four things and I say, I believe all of those things. I believe that God is great. I believe that God is glorious. I believe that God is good. I sing about those. I profess those. I know verses about those. I can tell you verses about God is God's goodness. I can tell you verses about God's greatness. I can tell you verses about God's glorious uh, majesty and power. I believe those things. But there's this thing I believe, but then there's this way I live. And how I live reflects whether I truly, if those are just statements that I make or if those are convictions that I deeply have. This week we're going to see that the way to fight our desire for the approval for others is to see that God is glorious. He is the only one worthy of glory and honor and praise. And the only approval that should matter to us is the approval that he gives us through Jesus. Now listen, we're all created with the desire to be loved. The desire is healthy and natural. And we're not talking this morning about our general need for wanting love and approval. God has created us as people that need others. But the problem is that when you have this overwhelming desire for approval that is not ultimately satisfied in God, and you seek love and affirm affirmation from those that you think is more important and more significant than God. See, those with an approval idea look at God and say, God, I understand that you love me. I understand that you approve me because of what Jesus did on the cross, but that's not enough. I need this person to love me. I need this person to accept me. I need this to happen in my life. I need all of this. And so you're never satisfied until you get this approval from other person. I need people who are important to love me and acknowledge me. So, do, so what will happen is they'll do just about anything to get the approval of people that matter to them to literally buy the acceptance of other people. And so what you see is you see people that overcommit. You see people that overpromise. You see people that overstate to gain affirmation from others. They're insecure in their own identity with Jesus and fear the rejection of people above the biblical fear of God. This is a little complicated because there's a thin line between wanting to be loved and having this false idea a false God of needing the approval of others. Here's different ways that we could see it. We could see cowardice when 
someone is struggling with the need for approval. They're so scared they're so, that they cower in a corner every time they go somewhere. Or on the flip side, you could see aggression. They've got to be the center of attention. They've got to be the one that everyone is drawn to. They've got to be the one that everyone is attracted to. They've got to make jokes all the time. They've got to make people laugh all the time. They have to show that because they have to show that because they long for others to look at them and approve of them. You can see conformity, where you'll compromise just so you could fit in. Or on the flip side, you could see nonconformity. You're like, I'm not going to be like them. I'm going to be different so I could stand out from the crowd. You can be overcommitted. You can be uncommitted. You can be so committed that you're trying to win the approval of others, or you can be not so committed because you're afraid that, um, man, others will see the real me if I get involved or get plugged in. Or what, what if they don't accept me if I do a bad job? You could be overly needy, or you could be hyperly independent. You could be boasters who are bragging about yourself all the time, or you could be ones who bash yourself all the time. You could be like Igor. Woe is me, nothing good, nothing good, right? You could avoid people, or you could be hyper needy. You could spend your entire life comparing yourself to others around you. See, ultimately what we're going to see is that the fruit of all of this is something deeper. Underneath all of this is the fear of men, where people are exalted to a place where their thoughts and their opinions and their approval matter more than what God says about you. You find your identity in whether someone around you accepts you or approves you or not, and you fear people. In reality, friends, we all fear people in this room. All of us do. And we fear people for three reasons. First of all, people expose us. It is people that God uses to reveal to us our deepest character flaws. Right? I mean, it's, it's people that you usually get angry at. It's people that you're usually jealous of. I joke that there's no one that God uses more to make me more like Jesus than my wife. Right? Because she sees the worst in me. And she still loves me and accepts me. And she gives me grace. And through that, God is sanctifying me, making me more like Jesus. We fear people because they expose us. But we fear people because they reject us. We long for acceptance and know that there, people could reject us. We know that people could turn their backs on us. People could say, I don't want a friendship with you anymore. But we also fear people because people can attack us. Have you ever been hurt by someone? Ever been hurt by someone that was close to you? That you considered a really good friend? People expose us, people reject us, people attack us. And because of that, we either cower in fear or we become strong and we bully others. All of this is because of the fear of people. The fear of man fuels the need for approval. All of us have this issue. From my own life, I, I've learned that I could be liked and loved by every single one of you in this room, but if Roman back there doesn't like me, it could mess up my world. Right? Roman, you're not that valuable, sorry. Um, bad example, someone else. Um, no. uh, but all of you could love me. But if there's one of you that doesn't like me, it'll mess with me. It'll bother me. Man, at that point, it's over. What's the source of that? It's the fact that people carry more weight than God does in my life. That God's approval of me is not as important as the approval of other people. And until we fully understand the approval that God gives us in Jesus, we will also always live our lives looking for the approval, the applause, or the recognition of other people in our lives. Regardless of what we may affirm with our mouths, regardless of how we define who God is to each other in our community and how we live, we will always be looking for other people's approval. And this morning, I would argue that most of us, including myself, will say, God is not glorious, I am. Our text this morning, Isaiah 6, is this incredible story of an encounter between God and the prophet Isaiah. It's a passage of this unholy man who meets this glorious God. 
He's living in a community that was not living for Jesus at all. He was not living for God's approval at all, but the approval of the people around them. Verse, t- verse 1 tells us that this encounter happens in the year that King Uzziah died. The people had experienced this long season of prosperity and wealth and peace and, um, in the community. And now their king was dead. And there was this uncertainty that was going on. And in that season, God appears to Isaiah, and he gives him this glimpse that reassures Isaiah. Isaiah Isaiah sees God. He sees that God is glorious. And I want you to notice four things from this text. Number one, the vision that Isaiah has. Verse one says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. First thing I want you to notice is the vision Isaiah has. This vision, he sees that despite what's going on in the nation, despite the fact that the king has died, despite the fact that they don't know what the future holds, Isaiah sees that God is still on the throne. That God is truly in charge, even though it seems like the nation is in chaos, that God is still king, that God is still judge, he's still God, and his throne is high and lifted up. It is raised higher than any other earthly throne. He's the only true and sovereign God of the universe. This is what we talked about last week, that God is great. That means he's greater than earthly kings, earthly rulers and bosses and people in our lives. But look at God's clothes in this verse. The kings of the day would have long trains that showed their glory. God's train, scripture says, filled the entire temple. It was a reminder that even in their disobedience, God was still in their presence and that he was still more glorious than anything else in this world. But Isaiah sees even more. Look at verse 2. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. These were angelic beings that flew all around God. They had six wings that made them different from even more likely powerful angels. But notice their response. They were so humble they couldn't even look at God. They covered their faces. They were too impure to be in the presence of God. They cover their feet. They fly around seeking to do God's will. These perfect heavenly beings are blown away by the glory of God. And they don't keep silent about it. They cry to each other in verse 3. Verse 3 says, And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. These angelic beings proclaim God's holiness. And that holiness refers to God's majesty, being separate from all of his creation, as well as his purity, being different from all of his creation. And they say it three times. He is holy. He's the holiest. He is holier than me. They sing of his glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. He is the glorious one, scripture says. He's the glorious one. The one that carries the most weight. The one whose opinion matters the most. He is both beautiful and beautiful. And he's powerful. All of us know people who are beautiful or powerful. We know people who are powerful, but they might not necessarily be beautiful, right? Your bosses, for example. You don't call them beautiful, do you? Um, But we also know people that are beautiful, but they're not necessarily powerful. My children. Uh, (laughs) Beautiful beings. Um, But God is both beautiful And he's powerful. He's the most beautiful one. And yet he's the one that carries the most weight. Beauty and gravity. And scripture says his train fills the entire temple. His glory goes beyond the doors of the temple and fills the entire earth. These angels are proclaiming this to the whole earth. That it causes the temple to shake at its foundation. And there's smoke everywhere. This is the vision that the prophet Isaiah is seeing. You know, when we talk about angels today, we talk about these little tiny chubby beings, right, with little wings. But that's not the angels of the Bible. The angels that you have decorated in your home is not the angels that we see in Scripture. When people saw angels in Scripture, they were terrified. They would fall on their faces as as they were dead. When we talk... When we talk about talking to God today, we speak as if we're going up and talking to an old friend. But in Scripture, it was a frightening, life-altering experience to talk to God. It's an incredible vision that Isaiah sees here. I remember standing at the edge of 
Niagara Falls or Grand Canyon being blown away by the beauty that's around me. But the beauty here reflects a far greater beauty, God. The question is, do we have this kind of vision about God? Do we have this kind of vision about our Savior? See, this is the way that we see the world differently. But it's also the fundamentally the way how we see ourselves differently. The vision completely blows Isaiah away. Here's the second thing I want you to notice about this text, Isaiah's response. Verse 5, I said, woe is me, for I am lost. From a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, where my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Notice what Isaiah does when he finally opens his mouth. He speaks and he curses himself. He pronounced woes upon himself. He calls himself lost. He says, I'm not fit to be a prophet. I'm not fit to be serving these people. I have a dirty mouth. And so does the entire nation. Before, in this encounter, Isaiah might have thought that he was better than everyone else. Oh, God called me. God chose me. I'm better than you because God speaks to me. I'm the prophet of God. Give me respect. Give me honor. Give me the seat at the table. He said, you're not good enough. You don't hear from God. God must accept me. God must approve me because everyone else is living in sin. But look at me. God has chosen me. But then Isaiah sees God's glory. And everything changed. Everything changed. He says nothing is pure in relationship with God. He sees God's glory and all of a sudden he's humbled. And he identifies himself as a sinner among sinful people. What about you? What about me? When you look around people around you, do you say, man, I'm so much better than them? That I've got my act together. If they could just get their act together, things would be great. Or do you say, man, thank God that the same grace that saved me is the same grace that saved you. Thank God that the same spirit that's working in me is the same spirit that's working in you. That if God has not given up on you, that I'm not going to give up on you. How is your response to the glory of God? How do you see yourself in relation to God? Do you see yourself as deserving something from God? God, I come to church every Sunday, so you ought to give me what I want. I pray. I read my Bible. I give my tithes. I um, do all this stuff. God, you have to bless me. Or do you recognize that, God, I don't deserve any of this. It is only in your pure kindness and mercy and grace that I have what I have. It is not anything I could boast of. It is simply your goodness and kindness. Friends, there is nothing glorious about us as we stand in the presence of God. There is nothing that you bring this morning that God says, man, I'm so glad you have that. There is nothing that we can offer to God that makes God better. We're broken in the presence of God. Isaiah is broken and helpless there, and that leads us to the third observation, the healing that Isaiah receives. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphims flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he'd taken from the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Now, listen, it's hard to understand everything that's going on here, but the point of this is that there is nothing, through nothing of his own work at all, God cleanses Isaiah. He gets his mouth cleaned with soap, and now he's ready to do God's work. But more than that, he's forgiven. Your guilt is taken away. It's all by grace. This is the message of the gospel. It is completely by grace, so that it will be always be for his glory. We have nothing to boast about. We can only turn and praise him. Once we see ourselves in light of God's glory and see ourselves in light of our own sin, his grace, friends, is our only hope. And he gets the glory. And that leads to the fourth observation, the calling of the prophet. Verse 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And he said, then I said, here I am, send me. Here's Isaiah moving from 
woe is me, woe is me, to here I am. Here I am, God. If you would save a sinner like me, and if you would show love and mercy and compassion on a sinner like me, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do? I'll do it. Now he's ready to be the Lord's prophet. See, this is what grace ought to do to us. It immediately propels us to say, God, my life is no longer mine. It's yours. What do you want from me? What are you calling from me? We see his grace and friends. It ought to humble us. It ought to bring us to our knees and say, God, thank you for saving me. Now, how do I bring glory to you through my life? We tell people that he is glorious. Our motivation moves from a love of other people to be motivated by our love for God, which compels us to love other people. We want others to see who God is and give God the glory that he deserves. But here's the interesting thing. When you read Isaiah 6, God, Isaiah sees this incredible vision of God and has this encounter with God, and it humbles him. But Isaiah doesn't get a glorious job at all. In verses 9 through 13, we see Isaiah becoming an instrument of judgment for the people. God said that he would judge his people. And then as Isaiah proclaims the message, they ignore him. They reject him. They turn their backs on him. He gets to help hearts that are hardened, ears that are plugged, and eyes that are blind. What a fun job. What a great calling. That God would still be glorified, but only through judgment. Isaiah wouldn't get anything but humiliation in following Jesus. Are you... Pursuing God for the blessings that God give you, gives you? Or are you pursuing God saying, God, whatever you call me to do, whatever happens to me, it's not my life, not my will, not my dreams, but your will. Do we see that it will, following Jesus, will might bring suffering for us, as it did for Isaiah, for Jesus, for the disciples, for the early church? Following Jesus might not be a glorious path, it's all about his glory, friends. God shows the prophet Isaiah his glory, and he wants you and I to see his glory this morning. Now, there's so many things I could say about God's glory, but here's just a few things. His creation is meant to reflect his glory. The heavens, psalmist says, declare the glory of God, Psalm 19. Look at the mountains, look at the oceans, look at all of God's creation. It screams God's glory. And the pinnacle of his creation, human beings, you and I were meant to reflect his glory. We were made in his image, scripture says. We too were meant to put God's glory on display. But even in a way that rivers and waterfalls and mountains and animals could not do, we were supposed to reflect God's glory. And yet in the fall, that image was marred. We haven't imaged his glory as we were made to do. God has always been talking from the beginning of scripture about a people and remaking them into his divine image that they would display his glory again. Throughout the Old Testament, the scripture says that God chose and preserves a people, it says, for his name's sake, for his glory. They can't boast, it says, for it's his doing. This is the same in the New Testament. He says he's building a church that screams that God is glorious. And he's doing it through his son, Jesus, whose scripture in Colossians 1 says is the image of the invisible God who displays his glory perfectly and beautifully. This is our glorious God, and he wants us to see it and delight in it. Now, with all that glory in front of us, we still live for our own glory. We confess one thing with our mouths on Sunday morning, and we show another thing with our lives on Monday morning. We try to revolve the world around us in such a way that brings us honor. We're zealous. We're zealous for people to think well of us, and we can be jealous when they don't. We have this intense desire for approval. We have this deep fear of rejection. When people approve us, we're proud. We think highly of ourselves, and we feel good. When they don't, we're humbled. We have this low self-esteem, and we get depressed. Pastor John Piper said it this way, boasting is the voice of pride in the heart of the strong, Self-pity is the voice of pride in the heart of the weak. See, most of us, we live most of the time in what Proverbs 29 says is the fear of man. This is the way the Pharisees lived in the New Testament. Jesus would hammer them in the Gospels about how they would 
put on a show in front of people. You pray. Well, you're not really praying for God. You're praying so that other people could see you. You fast, but you're not fasting so you can be intimate with God. You're fasting so that the community around sees how pious and holy you are. You give because you don't really give because you love God, but you give so that other people could see your generosity. In John 12, it speaks of people who heard the message of God through Jesus the, during his time on earth, but they feared the reaction of the Pharisees to them. It says they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They wanted approval. They feared rejection. They lived for their own glory. You know, you and I, we can bash the Pharisees, but we too can live just like them. Now, let me give you a few examples. We have trouble saying no because we don't want to disappoint other people. We obsess with our body image, our weight, our clothes, because we want other people to look at us and approve of us. We shy away from reaching out to others because we're concerned that they might reject us. We walk away from conversations that we have, rehashing them, redoing them, pondering, where could I have spoken better? Where did I misspeak? What could I have done better? What could I have said better? Because we're like, man, what do they think of what I said? We might not lie, but we stretch the truth when we talk, about, talk to others because we want ourselves to look good. You come in here and you're more concerned about what others will think of you when you worship than what God thinks of you when you worship. Anytime someone criticizes you, you immediately get defensive. You attack back. Maybe you even get depressed and say, you know what, I'm not serving anymore. I'm not involved anymore. You'll look around and you'll compare yourself to other people around you. And either you'll boast yourself and say, man, I'm so much better than them. Or you'll get discouraged and saying, why can't God bless me with the things that they have? You find yourself doing what others do because you want them to affirm you. And you'll often compromise your faith in the context of that because you want people to accept you. You remain silent when you should speak up for the weak, the oppressed, the marginalized. But you don't speak up because of fear of what that might mean for you. By this, you hide your sins and your weaknesses because you fear what people will say about you if they know how messed up you really are. You don't speak about your faith as you should because, man, what if they reject me? What if they mock me? What if they don't want to be friends with me anymore? See, in the presence of the Lord of glory, in a world that displays his glory, among a people that are meant to praise his glory, before a Savior who perfectly images his glory and has lived and died to restore that image of glory in our lives, in that presence, friends, you and I can be consumed with our own glory. You and I can be consumed with our own lives. And yet this is an absolutely terrible way to live. I, as I was thinking through this, some words came to mind of why this is terrible. Number one, it's amusing. Think about it. Me? Glorious? No one has ever said I'm glorious. Has anyone called you glorious before? It's laughable. Thank you for laughing at me. Um, look at the desert sunset. Stand by Niagara Falls. Look over the cliff of the Grand Canyon. See the rainbow after the rain. Even the most famous and successful and handsome and beautiful person that Hollywood has ever produced pales in comparison to the glory of our God. It's amusing. But it's also exhausting. You can never keep it up. I don't know if any of you are Seinfeld fans, but there's this episode in Seinfeld where George... Um, 
is trying to put a tip in a jar, and the barista, and barista doesn't see it. And so he goes back and takes the money out and waits for her, um, and then he puts it back in. And then he doesn't see it again, so he puts it back in. And eventually he starts putting so much money in just so that he can notice. He almost gets arrested for trying to do this. You can't stand the thought of anyone not liking you. So you go to great lengths and to do big cartwheels just to get people to affirm you. You tell lie upon lie upon lie to craft an image of yourself that you can never keep up. And friends, it's exhausting and it's going to kill you. But it's also unloving. Think about it. If you're living for, to get approval and you feel rejection, you will never tell anyone anything hard. You will never speak truth to anyone, Christians or non-Christians. Because what if they don't like you? But friends, if I am living in sin, the most unloving thing that you could do to me is not speak truth in my life and let me destroy my life. The most loving thing that you could do, even though I might not respond well to you if you call me out, is to call, my, call me out on my sin. Because that is saying, listen, Sam, I love you enough to say you're destroying your life, and that's not what God desires for you. But if you live for the approval of other people, you'll never do that. We're called to be a part of a family where we know and love those around us. And that involves saying hard things. If the Christian life calls us to love God and love others, then people-pleasing will completely keep us from loving those around us. Just because you're friends with them and you hang out with them and you do a lot of things with them, but you never call them out if they're destroying their lives, you're not being a good friend. And you're not being a brother and sister. We're called to hold each other accountable. You're called to speak hard things into my life. I'm called to speak hard things into your life because that's how we love and care for each other. And we certainly will not share the gospel with people around us because of the message of the gospel, friends, Scripture says is offensive. How can we share that message, that offensive message to people? Because we'll lose friendships. They will not like us. They will hate us. And so we keep our mouth shut. No one at all knows that we are followers of Jesus. It's unloving. And so we will let our friends die without ever hearing the glorious message of the gospel and never having this chance to encounter Jesus. And it's also isolating. Think about it the other way around. We all want to be deeply known. We all want to be deeply loved. In one sense, we're made for approval. We're made for a family where we can be loved just as we are. But in our sin and our idolatry, we want, to see, uh, we want people to see us other than we truly are. So we keep ourselves from being known. We keep ourselves hidden. We put up walls and we put on masks so that people get this image of us that's really not us. We're so concerned about them liking us so we fear them turning their backs on us so that we really don't let them see us and know us. See, the beauty of church, the beauty of community is that we're called to be ourselves like family and still be wanted and loved and yet we strive to help each other grow and change. But at the end of the day, we're committed to each other regardless. That's what God has called us to be. That's family, right? When we live for approval of others, we rob ourselves of this joy. We isolate ourselves. But it's, again, it's also dishonoring. Think of what it says, of, says to God. God, it's my approval that matters. I'm glorious. I'm the center. Again, we are made for his glory, not the other way around. Friends, it's blasphemous to think that we are made for our glory. This is the most serious problem of fearing others. God is so zealous that he alone is glorified. As creator and Lord, he's the only one who can demand this. And if he is the only place where joy is found, then it is loving for him to do this. Also, he is jealous for him and him alone to be glorified. We are made for God. When we're about our glory and we're, we're about ourselves, we blaspheme God and we anger God. But friends, it's also dissatisfying. We're made to find our joy in his glory, not ours. George Harrison, the lead guitarist of the Beatles, once said, when you've got all the experiences, when you met all the famous people, when you made some money, and you toured the world, and you got all the acclaim, and you still sit there and you think, 
Is this it? Is this it? See, we are made for him, for his sake. This is where glory and joy is found. John Owen, an old, old theologian said, only a sight of his glory will truly satisfy God's people. The heart of believers are like a magnetized needle which cannot rest until it is pointing north to God. And so a believer will always be restless until he or she comes to Christ and beholds his glory. So finally, it's destroying. If we are made for God's glory, then living for our glory ruins us. This is what happened to King Uzziah in Isaiah 6. The background to King Uzziah is this. He had this great nation that he was leading, but at the middle of it, he started thinking that he himself was great. And he ended up going into the temple of God to offer a sacrifice to God. And that wasn't something a king was supposed to do, only a priest was supposed to do. And so he breaks the law of God because he thought that he was great enough to do what the other priests were doing. And so God strikes him with leprosy. And he ends up being, going from being the most glorious person in the kingdom to being the lowliest outcast. It destroyed him. But it's what God did to him. And friends, God will judge pride in us as well. He will not accept rivals. He will judge those that don't glorify him. This is part of our sinful nature. We may affirm that he is glorious, but we will live for our own praise. So what do we do about that? What do we do to live for God's glory? Let me give you... Five things and I'll close. How do we bridge the gap between what we say we believe about God and how we live? Five verbs. Number one, explore. If you want to get over yourself, get outside and explore God's glory. See how beautiful God's creation is. See how majestic God is. Read the Gospels and see of his love for you. The heavens declare the glory. The earth is filled with the glory. We need to see what the seraphim saw in Isaiah 6. Second, tremble. We need to get a bigger view of God. We need to regain a healthy fear of God. This is what Isaiah experiences here. And he wasn't so much at this moment thinking about himself and his position and his calling and his ministry or what others thought about him. At this moment, he was so consumed with who God was. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. It's where it all starts. He is the king. He is the judge. He is the one to whom we must give account. Now, friends, if you are a follower of Jesus, he no longer relates to us primarily as a judge, but rather as a father. But that doesn't mean he's our buddy. It doesn't mean that he's primarily about us and our joy and our satisfaction. In my house, my kids know without a shadow of doubt that me and my wife love them. But they also know without a shadow of a doubt that they are not the center of our house. They know that when they go wrong, we discipline. There is a healthy fear that, of an earthly father that a child should have. It's the same with us and our heavenly father. We need to open our Bibles and see his glory. And then we have to fear God more than we do others. In Matthew 10, Jesus says these words. He says, don't fear those who will kill your body, but they cannot kill your soul. But rather fear him who can destroy both your body and your soul in hell. Every time we're standing in front of someone and we're fearing, hey, what is this person going to think about me? And we're tempted to disobey God at that moment. You need to picture Jesus standing right there next to that person and say, whose approval am I seeking more? Whose rejection am I more concerned about? Friends, we need to tremble. Number three, we need to trust. Isaiah saw God's glory and he trembled. And then the Lord touched his mouth and forgave him. All of this by grace, totally for his glory. And this points us to the work of Jesus. Jesus, who perfectly imaged God's glory, humbled himself, came to earth, was humiliated on the cross. He who deserves all the approval, he who deserves all the applause, who deserves all the praise, allowed himself to be rejected, not just by people on this earth, but which they did, but he was also rejected by the Father in heaven. On the cross, he took our judgment if we have faith in him. His father turned his back on him so that he could fully accept us this morning. This is the amazing work of Jesus on the cross. And scripture says that if we put our trust in his life and in his death and his resurrection, friends, you and I can be saved. And then we're brought into this family. 
We have this new identity. We don't have to earn the approval of God. We don't have to earn God's approval. Jesus did that for us. We're now in the house of God so that we're fully accepted by him. He will never reject us. We are his sons. We are his daughters. We are his kids. He loves us. That means we also don't have to live for the approval of others. We already have God's approval. We've already been accepted by God. Why do we have to worry about the rejection of other human beings? We don't have to prove anything to God. We don't have to prove anything to others. We don't even have to prove anything to ourselves. We are in Christ. And because of that, we have his full love and we have his full acceptance. Fourth, worship. How do you attack living for your own approval? You worship. This is what the seraphims were doing. This is what Isaiah ends up doing. See, we seek to give God glory in our lives in our daily personal worship with God and during our times together as a church community. We strive to proclaim how amazing and glorious he is, and that allows us to get the attention off of us and onto God. If you don't have a personal worship time with God, can I encourage you on a daily basis, pause and reflect on God's glory. God's majesty, God's goodness in your life. Pray, read scripture, because that's the only way you are going to stop living for the approval of other people and living for your own approval and living for God's approval. The best way to fight self-worship and seeking the worship of others is to worship the one who truly deserves our worship, which is Jesus. And friends, we generally need others to help us remember this. This is why Jesus didn't leave us alone. He puts us in community to remind us that we're not that great. Worship, whether it's personal or corporate, centers us down, it sets things straight, it reminds us who alone is really glorious. Finally, go. The Lord sent his prophet Isaiah out as a prophet. Jesus sends out his people as well. If we want to fight our slavery for approval, we do it by calling other people to worship. If we evangelize correctly, we'll always make it about God's glory. We won't make the message about us and how great we are and all the things that we are doing. We'll tell people that God and God alone is glorious and worthy of worship and praise. But along with Isaiah, we'll take a lot of abuse as people will want nothing to do with God. They might not want anything to do with us. People will remind us how unglorious we are. People will remind us like, I know your past. I know what you've done. They'll remind us. But at that moment, it will remind us whose glory we're really seeking. Sharing the gospel, being engaged and living on mission for Jesus will go a long way in keeping us humble and keeping us boasting in Jesus and Jesus alone. Explore. Tremble. Trust. Worship. Go. Five things that we could do to fight off the fear of others and seek the glory of God for us. So we do that, what's promised for us? You look at Isaiah 6 and you see that God approved of Isaiah. And friends, God will also approve of you. Remember those disciples who rejected Jesus but chose the praise of men instead of the praise of God? The implication there is that if we embrace human rejection... If we're willing to put ourselves to say we're going to live for God more than the approval of men, you will get the affirmation of God. He will praise us. Yes, Christ's suffering was followed by his glory. And that also applies to us. Because when you live for God, you will hear those words from God that says, well done. Well done. I'm proud of you. I love you. I affirm you. You are my son. You are my child. Keep going. And as Christ said, our Father will reward us. And it will be so much greater than what anyone else can give us. He will approve of us. And we will be with him, delighting in his glory forever. And friends, that's good news. Whose approval are we living for? Whose glory are you consumed with? What motivates you in life? Whose acceptance are you seeking? And I remind you that the one whose opinion matters, if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, the one whose opinion matters looks down on you this morning and says, I have loved you, I love you, I will always love you. You're mine.